Okay, so this is actually chapter nine, part two. So this is a continuation of chapter nine. And um, where we left off, we were really talking about muscle contraction. And so I just kind of want to review this muscle contraction before we move on. Um, now remember, you have a neuromuscular junction, and this is really the motor neuron. So motor neurons, you have one that originates in your brain in the primary motor cortex, and that can send uh, an action potential electrical signal down the motor neuron. Synapses on a second motor neuron in your spinal cord, and that motor neuron makes it all the way out to the level of the uh, muscle fiber. So this is a muscle fiber. And uh, there's gonna be a neuromuscular junction, and that is the junction between the motor neuron, so one, and the muscle fiber. And specifically, um, an area of the muscle fiber called the motor end plate. And the motor end plate has receptors to bind um, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine uh, is the neurotransmitter <clears throat> that will bind uh, to these receptors on the motor end plate. And so we call that the neuromuscular junction. And when that happens and acetylcholine binds, it generates an action potential. And that action potential then is going to go and travel down the T tubules. And so um, this action potential traveling down the T tubules, when it gets to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open, uh, and calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, um, the frequency of the action potentials arriving at the neuromuscular junction. So if you have an increase in the frequency, that's a Q, um, of action potentials arriving at the neuromuscular junction, that's gonna equal more numbers of voltage-gated calcium channels to open. And for longer, open and longer. And that's gonna result in an increase in calcium being released. Now, that's important because calcium is the signaling molecule uh, for the myosin heads to bind to the actin strands. So calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's gonna to bind to a molecule called troponin. Uh, so calcium will bind. That will move this rope-like strand here called tropomyosin off the active sites for the myosin head to then bind. So the more calcium molecules are present, the more calcium is bound to troponin, the more active sites are exposed, and then the more myosin heads can attach. And that's, that's important because that, those cross bridges, those myosin heads, when they attach, they form a cross bridge, and the number of cross bridges are gonna determine the strength of that contraction in a muscle fiber. So again, if you have a higher frequency, that's frequency of action potentials, that's gonna to equate to an increase in calcium released and an increase in calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum results in more um, cross bridging. Right, so more myosin heads are attaching the actin strand and that equals more force generated in muscle fiber. So an individual muscle fiber, um, the brain can control individual muscle fibers by increasing the frequency of action potentials to that muscle fiber. Higher the frequency, um, it results in the higher number of cross bridging and the higher number of myosin sites our myosin heads binding to the actin strand. So this right here is called a cross bridge. Right, so I didn't really do this all that well. So let's try that again. Cross bridge, I just am, right? And that's a cross bridge. So anytime a myosin head reaches across, um, binds to an active site on the actin strand, 
it's going to form a cross bridge. When myosin heads attach, form a cross bridge, it's automatically going to pivot. It's going to release that energy that's stored in the myosin head. That energy was um, basically put into the myosin head by hydrolyzing ATP here, because there's a little ATPase enzyme. And remember, the speed of that enzyme determines um, whether it's a fast twitch or slow twitch muscle fiber determines. Uh, so fast twitch versus slow twitch. So um, the fast myosin ATPase is fast switch. And, and so it will pivot faster, it will move faster, and so those muscle fibers will slide faster. Um, upon pivoting, you need a second ATP to bind to basically have it um, release. Um, so the myosin head will release. It will now hydrolyze this ATP and reconfigure itself, re-energize itself to start the cross bridge cycle over again. And so again, this goes through, you know, here's the neuromuscular junction. You have the acetylcholine being released. It generates an action potential, goes down the T tubules at the terminal cisterna here at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That will open voltage-gated calcium channels to release calcium. Calcium binds to troponin on the actin strand, and that moves tropomyosin off so you can have a cross bridge. Cross bridging will continue until there's no more AP, right? So action potential ceases. Calcium is pumped, right? So you have active transport of calcium back into sarcoplasmic reticulum. No calcium, bound to troponin, tropomyosin moves over the active site, and then cross bridging also stops. And the muscle will return to its resting leg. By the way, acetylcholesterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Um, and we'll talk about that in more in physiology, but I'm just kind of giving you an overview. Um, so sarcomere um, length and tension, and this is kind of a, a, something that you're going to touch on in functional anatomy, but I'm going to I'm going to go over this here. Is that um, there is an optimal overlap of actin and myosin. And what is meant by that is that here, this overlap allows for maximal cross bridging to occur, right? So maximal cross bridging because the maximal number of myosin heads are over and, and, and directly um, next to binding sites on the actin strand. So if you needed to engage all of those myosin heads, they could all attach to the actin strand. So that's act optimal overlap. If you have too much overlap, there's nowhere to go, right? So there's no place for it to slide any further. So you're gonna have no tension. It's, it's, it's already a slit, these, these actin strands have slid all the way over the myosin, there's no place to go. And on the flip side, if you have no cross bridging, no cross bridging, then you can't slide at all, right? So no cross bridging here, and so, Again, zero force is going to be generated because no myosin heads are even near the actin strand. So this is kind of showing you, you know, why this uh, produces only so much force, right? And why this only produces so much force and why this is maximal, right? You have maximal cross bridging. So that is, that is the sarcomere length tension um, uh, production. Um, so motor units. So I talked about the fact that your brain, your motor neurons, you know, originating from your brain can control muscle fibers and how many cross bridges are formed and thus how much tension in a muscle fiber. But in an entire muscle, 
your brain not only can control the individual muscle fibers um, forming cross bridges and how many, but it can also use what are called motor units. So <clears throat> motor units is one motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers it innervates. So when I talk about a motor neuron coming in and it goes into a muscle, right? So this is a muscle here. It's gonna branch. And this red motor neuron here is gonna innervate this and this, and they're spread out throughout the, um, throughout the muscle. And then you have the blue one and it innervates these, right? And then you have the purple and it's got these. So your brain can decide, I only need a little bit of force. So I'm just gonna have motor unit three. And so only these muscle fibers are going to be excited and contract. And they're spread out throughout the muscle, so it's a smooth contraction throughout the muscle, but you're only using the purple muscle fibers. If you want more tension, right, then you can deploy motor unit two, right? And so you start having more tension because now you're using two motor units. And if you want maximal force, then you deploy all your motor units, and that's called peak tension. So when you deploy all of your motor units, right, so you um, use all motor units in a muscle at the same time, that's peak tension. So when you're lifting the heaviest weight possible, chances are you're using all your motor units, that's peak tension, and they're all gonna run out of ATP at the same time. So that's why you can't uh, do too many repetitions when you're, when you're using peak tension. Uh, if you are using lighter weight and you're only using some of these motor units, right? So say you're doing light weight and you're using the red motor units. And then the red motor units fatigue, but that's okay because when those red motor units get tired, you start using the purple motor units. And then when the purple motor units start running out of ATP and getting fatigued, that's okay. You start using the blue motor units. And so this is more of a lighter weight. You can do more repetitions because you're using your motor units one at a time instead of all at once. So weightlifting is really um, kind of deals with the principle of motor units. Um, and so tension is determined not only by one, the frequency of stimulation of a motor neuron, right? Because if you stimulate one motor neuron with a high frequency, that's gonna result in a high number of cross bridges in uh, each muscle fiber of the motor, of motor unit. So you're controlling the number of cross bridges of each muscle fiber in that motor unit. And then the second thing your brain can do is increase the number of motor units used, right? So uh, your brain has two ways to control tension in an entire muscle. Um, one thing to, to, to note is that all muscle fibers in a motor unit are gonna contract at the same time. That is to say, if red motor neuron is excited, then all red muscle fibers contract. Okay. The second thing is recruitment. So recruitment is you use motor unit one, you need more force, you use motor unit two, you need more force, then you start deploying motor unit three, you are recruiting motor units. So you do it in a certain pattern. Um, another thing to talk about is size, size of a motor unit. Now a motor unit could be large and it could be small, right? So a motor unit that's only controlling two to three muscle fibers is going to be a small motor unit. And small motor units have really good control over muscles. They have precise control because you have one motor unit only going to a couple of muscle fibers. In larger muscles like your quadriceps um, and your gluteals, you have 
up to 2,000 muscle fibers in one motor unit. And so these are large motor units. And you give up control when you have large motor units, but it doesn't matter, your leg is just extending, right? So your quadricep just extends your lower leg. Uh, you don't have to have a bunch of control, it's just doing one thing. So you tend to find large motor unit muscles um, in those big muscles that don't do um, a bunch of different movements, does one or two movements, and then precise control or small motor units in your eyes and in your fingers and areas where you really wanna have precise control. So again, motor units and muscle control, frequency of stimulation, right? Results in number of cross bridges formed in muscle fibers of motor units. And then number of motor units involved is recruitment, right? And so the amount of force in the entire muscle is gonna depend on the number of motor units and the frequency of stimulation of those particular motor units. Um, muscle tone, muscle tone is resting muscle tension in the, and uh, it, it's, it's basically a low level of stimulation or excitement of motor units in a random pattern. Um, it's low level, it's, it's not enough for you to move, but it's enough for you to cross bridge those muscles so they stay in the same position, right? So um, resting muscles, we all have muscle tone because if you're sitting up right now, you're not falling over, that means your muscles have to be stable in the position that they're in, in the length that they're in. And so there is cross bridging occurring, um, but at such a low level, you're not contracting or going anywhere. They're just keeping your muscle at the exact same length. Uh, and that's called muscle tone. You have these little receptors embedded in your muscles called muscle spindles. And these muscle spindle receptors are what are monitoring the overlap or stretch of that muscle um, fiber. And so if the muscle fiber gets longer or shorter, those muscle spindles will then let your cerebellum and your brain know that muscle length is changing and they will um, correct that for you. You might notice that if you start to fall asleep and your neck muscles start to get a little bit longer, those muscle spindles will react, let your brain know, and your neck will then shorten back up kind of snap back up before you completely hit the desk. So it's, it's kind of protective when you're actually sitting in lecture, falling asleep, which you guys probably wish you got to do that these days. Now you get to fall asleep at home, <clears throat> which is too easy to fall asleep. Uh, okay, hypertrophy. This means you're increasing muscle size. And I can't even spell muscle. Muscle size. Right, so hyper, hypertrophy, hypersize. Um, depending on the type of exercise you do, uh, it's doing a number of things. So if you do cardiovascular exercise, um, like a CrossFit, and you're doing um, some cardio in there, you can increase the number of my, uh, mitochondria in your muscle fiber. Um, you also increase the activity of the muscle spindles, and what does that mean? You have more control over um, muscles. Right, uh, concentration of glycolytic enzymes, it means you can create more ATP anaerobically. Uh, more glycogen reserves, more substrate uh, for anaerobic glycolysis, which can go on to uh, citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, create more ATP. Uh, you can increase the number of myofibrils. So when a muscle gets bigger in size, because you're lifting heavy weights, a lot of that is due to increase in the myofibrils. And if you have more myofibrils, guess what? You have more numbers of cross bridges and more cross bridges equal more force, right? So um, that's good, right? But the net effect of all these things is your muscle fiber gets bigger. You don't actually increase the number of muscle fibers. You just increase the amount of stuff inside that muscle fiber.
Now the opposite is true. If you a means without, without size. If you don't use, you lose, right? So you lose all those gains and you'll decrease the number of mile fibrils or your, your muscle fibers won't spend any energy rebuilding them because you're not using them, right? And so you also lose muscle spindle activity. Right, so muscle spindles kind of lose connectivity with your brain, and so you decrease that. Um, we talked about the ATPase, the myosin head ATPase activity determines fast twitch or slow twitch. So if it's a fast um, ATPase, it can use that ATP fast. It's considered a fast fiber. Intermediates also have that fast, right? So both this and this are fast. This is slow ATPase. Um, they're also called white fibers because there's not a lot of, not as much blood supply. Uh, because it's not generating ATP using oxygen, these are glycolytic meaning they only do glycolysis. And so that's the G here, they're fast glycolytic. So glycolysis, and that's anaerobic. So it's not using oxygen uh, to generate ATP. It's doing it without oxygen, which is not a very efficient system. And you also start to build up uh, lactate or lactic acid um, in those fast fibers. Intermediate fibers are a little bit smaller in diameter than fast fibers, and they have a little better blood supply. So um, they look pink. Uh, they can generate ATP oxidatively using oxygen, or they can do it anaerobically um, doing glycolysis. So they're called fast because they have fast myosin ATPase, and they can generate ATP oxidatively or glycolytically. So oxidatively with oxygen or glycolytically without oxygen. Um, slow fibers, they're red. They have good blood supply. Um, and they only generate uh, ATP oxidatively, so they have to have oxygen available in order to create ATP. Uh, and um, they are slow to slow, slower to use the ATP because they have slow ATPase. So they generate um, ATP um, at a at a more at a higher rate, increased rate plus they use it slower so they can go longer. Um, and so you can see they're smaller in diameter, slow fibers are smaller in diameter, and, and you tend to find them more in postural muscles, muscles that we use all day long. Uh, whereas fast fibers, they're larger in diameter and they're gonna be found in areas where you really want a quick response in that muscle and you wanna be able to move um, that muscle quickly like in your eye muscles. So this just kind of goes through fast fibers or white fibers are large in diameter, um, big, good glycogen reserves because they need that glucose for, gly for um, glycolysis. They don't have many mitochondria because they're not using oxygen to generate ATP and thus they fatigue easily. They, they run out of resources easily. And they also build up lactic acid as a result too. Um, and, but they're powerful to contract. They're big in di diameter and they can cross bridge um, at a much higher rate. Versus slow fibers, they are three times slower to actually get that myosin head to pivot. Um, and they're smaller, but they can produce a lot of ATP efficiently with the use of oxygen. And so they can go for longer periods of time. These intermediate fibers, they're not quite as big as fast fibers, they're not quite as small as slow fibers, and they have properties that can be trained to be more slow twitch or more fast twitch. So these are your kind of in-between training fibers. You can't make a fast glycolytic muscle fiber into anything but a fast glycolytic muscle fiber, and same with slow. But the intermediate fibers, you can kind of train to be one or the other. Now you're born with a certain percentage of slow twitch, fast twitch, and intermediate. And so the areas that we can kind of train are in this intermediate area. I mean, of course, we can train our fast fibers to have more glycogen reserves and have more enzymes for glycolysis and so forth. But in terms of 
the myosin headache, ATPase activity, we can't train that. Or having better blood supply, it's never going to happen in a fast glycolytic. Um, but the fast oxidative glycolytic can be made to be more slow twitch and more of an endurance fiber, or it can be made into more of a sprinter fiber. So you get to learn all these wonderful things in x -Phys, if you go on. But this kind of gives you an overview of the properties of skeletal muscle fiber types. And so a few of these slides keep going through this. Um, last couple of concepts is the organization of muscle fiber arrangement. Um, so parallel muscle fibers are just like they sound, they run parallel. Convergent muscle fibers are a little bit different in that they can come from other places, but they all converge right on the same so this would be a convergent pennate is more like a feather they kind of come in a diagonal like that uh, and circular are just like they sound circular so when we look at these you can see this is parallel um, and then you have convergent um, parallel muscle fibers are are, are really the fastest arrangement because they're all lined up right so if they're all lined up like this they're all going to go in the same direction it's going to be faster because they can all contract so your hamstrings are parallel muscle fiber arrangements and they're fast so hamstrings are built for speed um, whereas convergent convergent are great because it offers an array of different movements. So your pectoralis major is an example of a convergent muscle fiber. So this tendon is attached to your arm and this is your sternum here. And you have the ability to basically pull your arm this way because this is the way these muscle fibers are arranged or you can pull it up or you can pull it down or you can pull it somewhere in between. And so this convergent muscle fiber pattern allows you to kind of bring your arm in straight across, slightly up, overhead, down low, um, and it gives you more, <clears throat> more options. Penny muscle fibers, these produce the highest amount of tension because you can pack the highest number of muscle fibers into a given area because they come in at a diagonal. So these are power muscles. So power muscles, have this arrangement. Um, your rectus femoris and your quads, they're built for power. Hamstrings are built for speed. Uh, deltoid that pulls your arm out to the side in abduction, that is built for power. Um, so pennate muscle fibers are very powerful arrangements. You get more muscle fibers in there. Circular muscles, we call them sphincter muscles. They are really there just to control the opening and closing of orifice. Uh, origin insertion. So we talk about muscle origin and muscle insertion and, and some programs refer to them as proximal and distal attachment sites. Uh, here's the one thing I'm going to say. Origin of a muscle does not move, right? It's stationary, so doesn't move. Uh, insertion moves. So that's kind of how you can always determine the origin and insertion of a muscle is that there's going to be one end attached to one bone and it doesn't move. And the other end is attached to a second bone and that bone moves. So the one that doesn't move on that bone is the origin and the one that's attached to the bone that moves is the insertion. So let me ask you guys a question. If you are using your uh, biceps brachii, uh, is the origin on the scapula or on the radius? So flex at the elbow, use your biceps brachii. What's actually moving? And hopefully you'd say radius, right? So radius is going to be the insertion and the scapula is the origin. Right, because one moves and the other does not. Um, muscle actions, uh, I always go by um, what joint is involved. So this is kind of my functional way of teaching. 
uh, in that I want you guys to know the major action of specific muscles and at what joint. And so we were talking about the biceps brachii. And if I asked you what the action of the biceps brachii is, you would give me the most common one, which is flexion at the elbow. Um, and so muscle actions are important to understand because if someone's injured and you say, well, it hurts when you do what? They show you the movement of what it hurts. If you know what muscles produce that particular movement, you can start to narrow down which muscles could be the problem. Um, instead of starting off uh, your anatomy career just memorizing origin insertions, I want you guys to learn the actions of the muscles. And then the next level would be then memorizing origin insertions if you're going on in physical therapy, physician's assistant, medicine, and so forth. Um, the muscle that is producing movement is referred to as the prime mover or agonist. Okay, so the agonist is the muscle that produces movement. But remember, we start off in anatomical position. We might move, right? So we might actually then bring our legs together and then bring our legs back apart. Uh, so we're moving, but if we go that way, we have to have a muscle that can go back the opposite way, or we would stay in that same position. We'd never be able to get back to anatomical position. So there's always gonna be one muscle that produces a movement, and there's gonna be another muscle that does the exact opposite movement. And this is interchangeable. So if we're talking about the biceps brachii, and we're saying it's the agonist, then there's flexion going on at the elbow. But the exact opposite, the antagonist, it's not contracting, it's not producing movement, but it can do the exact opposite. It's the triceps brachii, which um, does, I'm having a problem here, uh, extension. at elbow, right? So it does the exact opposite. So if you're doing flexion, you would say the biceps brachii is the agonist and the triceps brachii is the antagonist. But if you're doing elbow extension, then the triceps brachii becomes the agonist because it's doing the movement. And the biceps brachii becomes the antagonist because it, it's just kind of going along for the ride. Now, prime movers sometimes need helper muscles to assist in performing that particular movement. Um, those would be synergist muscles. Um, sometimes they're called fixators if they hold your joint in a particular place. So I'll give an example of this. Um, when you are... Uh, lifting something really heavy and you're flexing at the elbow. Your prime mover is actually gonna be your brachialis. It's really the big elbow flexor. But if you lift enough heavy weight, you're also gonna have the synergist, the biceps brachii. So the biceps brachii will help when you're really, really trying to lift something heavy. Um, if it's a heavy box, a fixator could be the coracobrachialis that then holds your arm right next to your body and fixes it there. So you can really use your brachialis and biceps brachii to pick up that box and flex at the elbow. Uh, last, last thing. I really want to um, kind of hammer in is that skeletal muscles are named for specific things. Try to attach new information to old information. And so, for example, brachialis. Well, now brachialis. Why is it called that? Because it's on the brachium. Trapezius, because it's shaped like a trapezoid. Um, two heads, biceps. You have a biceps brachii, you have a biceps femoris, right? So that's named for specific features and body parts. So biceps femoris, it's on your femur, it's one of your hamstring muscles. 
Uh, orientation of muscle fibers. So rectus is going to be straight along the axis of the body. That's rectus. Transverse are going to be in the transverse plane. And obliques are going to come at an angle, right? So they're diagonal. Uh, origin insertion, sternocleidomastoid, right? Uh, originates on the sternum and clavicle and inserts on the mastoid process. Or flexor carpi radialis. Is that going to be in the front or in the back? Well, stand in anatomical position, flex your wrist. When you flex your wrist, is that moving your hands forward or backwards? Hopefully you're saying forwards. So the flexors are going to be in the front, anterior. And then your radialis, is it medial or is it lateral? So hopefully you're saying lateral. So the flexor carpi radialis is going to be the lateral forearm muscle that goes down to your thumb in the front and it flexes your wrist or your carpals. Uh, so pulley and lever systems, you get into this really with biomechanics in that um, muscles always have, you know, they're going to move against resistance. Resistance can be gravity. I mean, it doesn't have to be a weight, right? It can be gravity in the weight of your skull. Um, but this is a first class lever system where you have the resistance and then you have the fulcrum in the middle and then you have an applied force. So it's like a, a teeter totter kind of situation. So it's showing you kind of the trapezius in the neck. Um, second class lever, you're going to have the fulcrum way on this side and then the resistance in the middle and the applied force going on the other side. So this is like this pulley system here for your Achilles tendon. Then third class lever, this is the most common where you have the fulcrum, but then you have the applied force and then the resistance on the end. And um, so, you know, your biceps breaking in this case is, is the applied force, right? It's pulling up because you have a weight or resistance going down. And here's the fulcrum. And where this uh, tendon inserts um, plays a role in how much this force has to be to lift this weight. And so you find that with um, tendon sites that are a little bit closer to um, the fulcrum or farther away from the fulcrum will determine the amount of applied force necessary. And so you, you start to learn those things in biomechanics. It's actually quite interesting um, and kind of showing you how tendons are like pulley systems. Uh, and so it's, it, biomechanics is very fascinating. But, um, you know, the bummer about aging is that uh, you have a natural decrease in the number of myofibrils. And um, so everybody loses muscle mass as they age. And so the same workouts um, don't do it anymore, right? You actually have to work out harder and more frequently just to keep the same number of myofibrils. And so um, it's kind of a bummer and you fatigue easy. And so um, this is like a boo, no fun situation. Um, yeah, so we're not even gonna, tolerance for exercise decreases, more boo, don't like this. Uh, but that concludes chapter nine. We still have chapter 10 and 11 to get through with muscles, so stay tuned.